right, let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for the time we get to spend together. and ask you to bless it and help us to understand as we uh, learn from your word and, uh, and, and deal with our own doubts and understandings and, uh, and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we are in the book of Judges still and the whole time of the Judges. And if you remember from last week, just a quick timeline, uh, the book of Judges is right here between 1500 and 1000 BC, and it's uh, the book of Judges plus the book of Ruth plus uh, the, the book of 1 Samuel is all that timeline of the Judges. So it's the, it's the beginning of the nation of Israel as a nation. After Joshua goes in and they take over much of Canaan, they don't take it all over, but they uh, establish Israel now in the land of Canaan, and now there's this, uh, and if you think about it, we're talking about three, four hundred years of time frame to, uh, to work through their issues as a nation. And in fact, you know, on, on your handout, I give you this uh, chart here, but you know, there was uh, quite a few judges. These are all the judges that are identified in uh, the book of Judges and in 1 Samuel. Uh, and there's also some other stories in the book of Judges. We'll do one of those next week. But uh, these are all the judges, and these are the time periods that they, uh, that they reigned, and they're all different. Some of these we only have like one verse on. And then this guy was a judge. And then this guy was a judge. We don't know anything else about them. For others, the ones that I put in, the, uh, in bold, we actually have uh, quite a bit of information on. And so we're going to talk about Samson today, in which there's uh, three full chapters uh you know, so a whole lot of information on samson and so we uh, but the interesting part about that timeline is that sometimes because of the way uh, judges is put together and the fact that israel is in these separate uh, separate clans if you will or you know the manasseh is different than gad and is different than asher and all the different sons of israel had their own areas we don't really know whether some of these judges overlapped each other in time frame in different parts of Israel. So there's some timing things, but in, in, in a sense, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be between three and four hundred years of, of history and, uh, and a significant part of history. And so I just, and you, know, I, you can't go through all of them, so I just uh, picked uh, six different uh, characters to work through in hopes that what we can glean from Judges, which is, I think, the most important, one of the most important things to do when you're studying stories from the Old Testament, is not the story itself, and what we, we tend to teach our kids the stories, right? But what we should be taking away from these stories is, is how does God interface <clears throat> with people? And how do people react to that interface? Because people are kind of the same today as they were, but God deals with people. What, what you tend to, what we'll see is that God can deal with people in many different ways. And he's not just limited to just the way he worked with you, right? And sometimes in our mindset, we think, oh, well, God did this for me. So therefore, he has to do it the same way for everybody else. And so I'm going to make sure you get the same you know, the experience I had. But I hope what we see is that, um, is that God can work differently through different people for different reasons. And what we end up finding within this study is, you know, humans are humans, and we don't always make the right decisions. Even when the angel of the Lord stands in front of us and talks to us, you know, we, 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 just, we just don't. We allow... Uh, our successes and our greed and our desire to take over. We, uh, and it happens in almost all of these stories. But secondly, like I said, we want to try to understand what God is like and how, and how he works. You know? And we'll, we'll see that in, in Samson today because there's a lot of interaction between, um, in different ways between God and Samson's parents and then between the Spirit of God and Samson himself. And then there's also two or three groups of people that just end up having no clue what God's doing around them. 
And honestly, that's me most of the time. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just ignorant. I, I don't see it, or I don't feel it, or I don't, you know, you know that, that God is at work, but you don't perceive it or understand it. And we'll see that in some of these stories in, um, in, in Samson. But let's go back to Gideon real quick, and let's end uh, and recap on Gideon, because You'll see in Samson that God deals with Samson differently than he deals with Gideon. In Gideon, Gideon was just a regular guy, uh, you know, pretty much most like most of us. He kind of wants security. He does he avoids risks. He doesn't really want to take on the leadership roles. He's a good follower, and he just kind of wants to keep everything kind of together for himself. And then the angel of the Lord shows up and talks to him directly. And he, you know, tests the, tests the Lord, and he gets confidence through these series of three uh, tests. The first one was, if you remember, that Gideon just asked the Lord for a sign, and the Lord gave him a sign. Then the second one time, when things were getting, a, when God was asking him to do harder stuff, he asked for a specific sign, the, the dew on the fleece and the fleece without the dew, right? And, uh, and, and God does that for him. doesn't you know, seem uh, a problematic for that. And then the third time, God gives Gideon a sign without Gideon actually asking. He gives Gideon the ability to uh, hear a dream from the, um, you know, uh, from the Midianites' camp that they were scared of him and that he was going to be successful. So in, in that dealing with um, Gideon, God is directly helping him to see and build his confidence. Well, he was successful in what he what he did, but then he went too far because his success went to his head. And he decided that, you know, not only can I wipe out Midian, but I can also gain great wealth from this, and I can have many wives, and I can have a lot of sons, and I can show my wealth to my, uh, my offspring. And that ended up uh, being his demise, and the son that he had from a concubine ended up killing all the rest of his offspring. And so, ends story ends. You know, for Gideon it was okay, but for his legacy, he didn't leave a very good legacy. And so, but uh, you know, but uh, God's interface with Gideon was direct, and very little interface with the rest of the Israelites. The only other interface God had in that story was actually with the invaders, with the Midianites. He had them fight each other. And had uh, you know had their army of 135,000 kill 120,000 of them. They killed themselves. Gideon only went off went off after the last 15,000. So you see this um, this interplay between God and uh, and Gideon, between God and the people of Israel, between God and the people of the Midianites. And is there anything you take away from that? Is there was there any things that uh, hit you on the Gideon story? I think once you, you you lose sight that it's really God doing it and you start taking personal credit and, you know, and you start allowing yourself to think that you are your success or your success is a result of you even those of us that are maybe well confident you know, God can quickly remind you that uh, no, 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 no. Who, who really gave you that success? Who gave you that confidence? And, and that is the story of Gideon: is God built up his confidence, and then he took ownership of that himself and <clears throat> went off for his own glory at the end. Uh, God could probably can use any circumstance and have all the odds stacked against him or his people, and he'll throw the odds right back in the other side's face. Right. Yeah, he is sovereign. He is in control. But the question is, is how, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and he can he can do all of that. So now we're going to go into Samson, and Samson's a totally different character. So whereas Gideon was kind of a meek, regular guy who kind of wanted to avoid the limelight or avoid risk, Samson, man, he knew from the beginning that he was chosen by God to do great things and was been given great strength. And if if you're the strong man in middle school that's a good position to be <laughs> but only for you not for anybody else 
Right, but so, so Samson is this guy who is not the meek guy. He is, he knows he's strong. He knows that he has something he's going to do. And as we move into the Samson story, and again, this is uh, multiple chapters, he's the last judge of Israel within the book of Judges. There's still Eli and, and, and Samuel to come, but within the book of Judges, he's the last of the judges, and a big chunk of, of time is given to him. What's interesting in this cycle of sin that, and redemption that we talked about last week is uh, you don't have any record of the people rejoicing, and you don't have any record of the people crying out for grief. Because actually, by the time of Samson, the people of Israel had been under the control of the Philistines for 40 years. So it's just kind of normal for them. They had come to take that as normal. Now, whether how much the Philistines controlled, without a doubt, they controlled the Danites and they controlled the, uh, the Judah. How far beyond that, don't really know. But from the story, we know that, um, so if you, if you kind of start here in Judges 13, verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. So here's the Philistines down here on the coast. You know, so towns like uh, Gaza, towns like Ashkelon, there's like five major cities of the Philistines, each of which had their own Philistine lord. Um, and, and the Philistines, most uh, of the archaeology and, uh, and the scholars, if you will, say that the Philistines uh, came from either Greece or northern Turkey or one of the islands in the Mediterranean and at some point uh, moved down and took over this uh, area of land prior to uh, Israel coming back in there. They had already been established. They were established here. And then so you have Judah and uh, Simeon and you have Dan and what we find out is uh, there was a certain man of Zora of the family of the Danites. So this is, uh, this is Samson's father, who is a Danite. So he's part of the, the tribe of Dan. And Dan has a very interesting history. We won't go into all of that, but uh, uh, if you read through the rest of Judges, what you find out is you know, Dan was given this land here, but they couldn't take it or hold it. So they ended up moving up here and taking land up here in a place that they really weren't supposed to go. And then, interestingly enough, I don't know if you if you follow uh, different aspects when the when the twelve tribes of Judah are mentioned, it's not always the same twelve because there's uh, there's the twelve sons, but uh, Joseph had two sons, each given the same amount, so that makes thirteen. But when there's twelve, and then sometimes the Levites aren't counted because they're not wasn't supposed to be given the land. So different times during the Bible, when you see the the twelve tribes listed, that's not always the same same twelve. But what I find interesting is in the Book of Revelation, when John's going through right now, and uh, the twelve tribes each get twelve thousand people who are saved for the hundred and forty four thousand. What tribes missing? Dan. Dan. Okay, the tribe of Dan is not in that list. They're punished. They're right? punished. <laughs> they, something. I don't know. The, the Bible doesn't reveal to us why, but it is interesting to go back as you see the unfolding of this time within the um, within the judges that Dan was given this land but couldn't hold it and went and took land up here that was supposed to be for Manasseh and Naphtali. So. Um, uh, I, I don't know all the significance of that, but it is interesting that they don't show up in Revelation. So uh, they're out for some reason. Um, I don't know. But Samson, uh, there's the first chapter of, uh, of the story of Samson is really not about Samson. It's about his parents. So you get an entire chapter about his parents, and I think that's uh, important. What you end up seeing, even with his mothers, there's this there's this uh, juxtaposition, if you will, between men and women in the story of Samson. And, and it's, it's uh, women are portrayed in this story as being the smarter and the more cunning and the more logical. And Samson is, and Samson's father, okay, are both seen as kind of uh, 
uh, the ones with too much drama and emotion. Just kind of the opposite in our culture to some extent, right? Or at least the way we think in our own cultures. You have a, you have a very different picture of the role of men and women within the book of, uh, I mean, within this story of Samson. And I, I, find, it, I find it quite fascinating because uh, the, you know, in verse three, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. So the angel of the Lord shows up to Samson's mom and says to her, you shall conceive and give birth to a son and no razor shall come upon his head for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So the angel of the Lord shows up and tells, uh, tells his mom, this is, this is a big deal. This is going to happen and that your son's going to be a, a Nazarite. So what's a Nazarite? Anybody know what a Nazarite is? Dedicates your life at the temple. Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, the word. Yeah, the, I mean, the word Nazarite just means uh, to uh, to separate, to be separate, to, to separate yourself, and to some extent, uh, specifically for the Lord's work, right? And in in Numbers, basically. It's, it, this is about all we have of the Nazarite vow in Numbers. Within a section of Numbers that's about consecrating the priests and consecrating the temple and setting things apart, there's this one little section that allows the, the non-Levites and the non-priests to also have some kind of opportunity to separate themselves for a short period of time for God's goodness. Kind of think of it, um, let me read it to you and then I'll talk through it. It says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, whether a man or woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grapes, juice, nor eat the flesh of dried grapes. And it goes on to say, even you can't even touch the seeds, you know, um, of, of, of the grapes. Nothing of the vine. You can't do anything of the vine. And it says, all the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head, and he shall be holy until the days are fulfilled, which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall let the locks of his hair grow, and his hair grow long. And then the next paragraph says, and he shouldn't touch any dead body. So don't defile yourself with the dead. And... Uh, let your hair grow and don't touch anything that has to do with the vine. Those are the three aspects of being a Nazarite. So if you wanted to dedicate yourself to some work of the Lord for some small period of time, some specific period of time, you could take the vow of a Nazarite. So to some extent, you know, maybe you can equate that to a type of fasting, right? So you know, we do sometimes, I don't know if you do any fasting or not, but it's definitely a big Old Testament thing. You, you know, for a short period of time, you're going to give up something in order to for, for help you focus on the Lord, right? So in this case, you'd give up touching dead bodies, you'd give up cutting your hair, and uh, you'd give up uh, touching anything having to do with the vine. The vine always represents in Israel the rest of God's rest, right? So when they went into the Holy Land to check it out and they came back to give the report, what did they take back with them? A bunch of grapes, right? To show that the land is wonderful and is, it, it will provide us God's rest. And, and even in the New Testament, you have, uh, you, you have the idea that uh, I, you know, in John, uh, I think it's uh, yeah, John 15, uh, I am the vine, and you are the branches. You ab you abide in me. You can do nothing if you don't have you know. So the idea of the 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 vine being, or the or the grapes being a picture of God's rest and comfort. To some extent, you could say if you're going to avoid that, it means I am not going to rest. I'm not going to rest until God accomplishes this great thing. Whatever it is, whatever you want to set aside. But for Samuel, he was going to be not a Nazarite for a small period of time. He was going to be a Nazarite from birth for his entire life. So, interesting thing. As we go through, 
uh, in verse 8. Uh, so here's the, this is one of my fun parts. Is, so the Lord shows up to the wife and tells the wife what's going to happen. The wife goes to the husband and says, hey, the angel of the Lord just showed up and told me what's going to happen. And he basically says, I don't believe you. <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure I can take what you say. You know, So he then prays to the Lord to ask the Lord to come back and tell him. You know, and so uh, and so, but and so God listens to Manoah's prayer, and guess what He does? He comes back, but He comes back to the wife again. Right? And then the wife runs out to the field, gets her husband, brings him back, and there's the angel of the Lord there again. So you have this um, <coughs> angel of the Lord that looks amazing or wonderful, at least to the to the wife that has some type of glow about him. And, the, and Manoah doesn't really realize who the angel of the Lord is. Um, and, and so he says, um, he says, stay here and I'll uh, prepare you a burnt, I'll prepare you an offering. And the angel says, I don't want your food, but if you want to offer it to God, that's fine. And so then in verse 17, Manoah says to the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask me my name, seeing it? is wonderful or beyond comprehension and um, and and so he, he he has this desire to have the angel of the lord to really explain to him what's going on uh, and that word wonderful is not a word used very often uh, it, it, it's wonderful fantastic beyond understanding but pertaining to that which is just bizarre, marvelous, wonderful, you know. So the angel doesn't give him his name. He kind of asks him. But the angel does say to, say to him, this is, I think this is, this is the irony of it. <laughs> so the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, let the woman pay attention to what I told her. He says, I told your wife. She can tell you. you know, Listen to your wife. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a bunch of elbowing going on in the room right now. <laughs> right? Let, you know, let, listen to your wife. The, and this is the, you know, uh, and I just kind of find that funny only from the perspective that that idea, it, it, if it was the only time it showed up in the story, that would be one thing you couldn't wouldn't take much from it. But it shows up with all the other women associated with Samson. They kind of do the same thing. They, you know, uh, Samson is the strong man, right? But Samson actually wants to be seen as the smart man. And so what we'll notice in the life of Samson is that he will use uh, riddles, lying, and deception in order to make him look smarter, not just stronger. And in each one of these cases, the, the women in his life use that against him and thwart his intentions. It's really kind of fun to watch that juxtaposition as it goes through. And so, um, so the angel ascends, and nobody sees the angel of the Lord again. Samson never sees the angel of the Lord. So here we have a whole different interface between God and and. The, the judge. So for Gideon, Gideon's the one that saw the angel of the Lord, and Gideon went forward. For Samson, the angel of the Lord just shows up to the parents and tells them, you know, tells them that, that their son's going to do great things. And uh, and so in verse twenty four of chapter thirteen, it says, "Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson, and the child grew up, and the Lord blessed him." And this, and here's the key, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. So here's an Old Testament guy in which the Spirit of the Lord is now stirring in him. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how that's happened or what it is. It just says the, the Spirit of the Lord stirs in him. So now here's a new interface between God and people. We go on to see three, three major stories, so kind of four stories about Samson. And his weakness, sadly, always tends to be women. 
Um, it's our life story, man. It, <laughs> it's our life story. It, you know, it, it is it is definitely one for the for the books, and one that is a good reflection of society in general and the differences in 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 how God has created us. And so the first story is about the, the Samson's wife, not given a name. The second story is about a harlot, a prostitute that Samson goes and spends some time with. And the third one is the story of Delilah. And that's probably the story you've all heard, the story of Samson and Delilah. But it's only, you know, she's the third one in, in the list. The first one shows up uh, in, in 14, one through 15, eight. It's a pretty good sized story. And it starts out uh, in verse 2. I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, and he says to his parents, get her for me, for my wife. So you got to think, here's our first interface now with Samson as an adult, if you will. And... Uh, and you know that Samson's parents knew that he was special. So you wonder how they treated him as a kid. But Samson knew he was special. And he says, hey, Dad, go get me that woman. It's kind of what David said when he saw Bathsheba. It's kind of what Eve said when she saw the apple. Yeah. I like that. That looks good. I'm going to take it. And he does. And uh, and he ends up getting the the uh, uh, the woman. And as he's going down to Timna, if you remember this story, as he's going down to Timna, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And that's a that's a that's a that's a statement multiple times within this story. So the spirit that is in him or on him or with him. However that is, the spirit of the Lord came upon him in great strength. He saw a lion, um, you know, on the trail, grabs a lion, rips it in half, you know, as if it's just a, you know, a, a, a piece of paper or whatever, and then throws it down. And then the next time he's walking on, he sees that same lion. Now he's going to go see his, uh, his wife, and, uh, and he sees the lion, and there's a bunch of honey that has been... Uh, bees that have gone into the carcass of this lion, and there's a bunch of honey, so he reaches down and grabs some honey. Well, what's one thing that a Nazarite is not supposed to do? Touch death. Yeah, you're not, you're not supposed to defile yourself with the dead. Now, realistically, it's dead humans or dead bodies, but in general, it's defilement with the, with the dead. And so what we start to see in this, you know, because you wonder, well, why did they put this little section in here? But what you start to see is that, that even though Samson knows that God will work with him and in him and makes him strong, he doesn't necessarily take the vow of the Nazarite seriously all the time. And you'll see that again with Delilah, when Delilah, when he says, you know, cut my hair and that'll take care of my strength, right? So, so here's with the wife, he says, get her for me. And... Um, and, uh, and, and he marries her, and he uh, sees this, he grabs this honey, and he shows up for the, this big feast he's going to give to the to the people of Felicia. And the 30 guys show up, and, and uh, he says, hey, I got a riddle for you. And he says, uh, and they say, well, tell us the riddle. He says, well, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. And he says, if you can guess my riddle, I'll give you 30, you know, there's 30 of them. I'll give you 30 changes of clothes. Well, change of clothes, is a, that's an expensive proposition in that time. You know, to have, uh, you know, to have a, a, a good set of clothes is important. To have more than one is, is a really, really big deal. And uh, he says, but if you can't answer this riddle, then boom, you know. And so, uh, so they entreat his wife and they say hey you got to find out what the answer to this riddle is go find out from samson what the answer to this riddle is and so samson in verse 16 there chapter 14 it says samson's wife went before him and said you only hate me and you don't love me you have propounded a riddle to the sons of my people but haven't told me and samson said to her behold i haven't even told it to my father and mother why should i tell you that's probably not the way to go into a marriage. <laughs> but nonetheless, 
the uh, uh, she uses her, she says, and says, however, she wept before him seven days while their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he finally told her because she pressed him so hard. So she overcame. She figured out how to get the info out of Samson, and Samson ultimately gave up the answer. The 30 guys answered the riddle. They said, uh, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And then Samson said, well, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would have not been able to know this riddle. And so he used that. So this is how God used him to attack the Philistines. So he went out to a Philistine uh, 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 town, killed, seven, killed 30 people, took their clothes, and then gave them to the 30 that were at the party. Okay, not a good way to make friends. <laughs> no. And then what happens is because he left there and did that and his the father of the wife thought that Samson didn't love her anymore and so gave his wife to a companion as a, as a wife. And then, and, then, and then it starts in chapter 15. Now we have the next uh, section of this story. It says, after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a young goat and said, I'll just go up to my wife to her room. But her father didn't let him in. Her father said, I really thought you hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? And then Samson said, this time, I shall be blameless in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. And Samson went, and you know this story, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but he went and caught uh, 300 foxes. He uh, tied a torch, between, put their tails together, you know, two of the, you know, in pairs, put a torch attached to the tails, light the torches on fire, and sent, so 150 pairs of foxes throughout all the Philistines' uh, uh, grain fields and burn down all of their food supply and just kind of big time wipe them out. Well, they didn't like that. The Philistines didn't like that very much. And so uh, they said, well, who did this? And it's Samson, the son-in-law of the Temanite, because he took his wife and gave her to his companion. So they found out Samson did this because the, the wife's dad gave the wife to somebody else. So the Philistines then went to her and her father and burned them in the fire. Not a good thing. And so then Samson said, well, since you're going to act like this, you know, you, I'll surely take revenge on you and then I'll quit. And so he struck them. And it doesn't tell us how he did it in this. This is verse 8 of chapter 15. He says, he struck them ruthlessly with a great slaughter and he went down and lived in the Clefo rock. So he killed a bunch of Philistines as a result of that. And he went and kind of hid in the desert area, the rocky clefts area of Edom. And so then the next story starts. The Philistines then went up. So this was this would be in the area of Judah, so a little south of where the Danites were at the time. And, and um, the men uh, and the Philistines came and spread out in, uh, in Judah in order to attack them. And the men of Judah said in verse 10, why have you come up against us? And they said, we've come up to bind Samson in order to do as he did to us. And then 3,000 men of Judah went to go get Samson. So here's Israel now going to get Samson and turn him over to the Philistines. So you got to think, what if, do the, does Judah have any idea what Samson is supposed to do for God? Are, there, there's no indication here that they're, they're, they're being moved by God or told by God or doing anything by God. They're in fact pretty much just ignorant of what's going on. And they want their own safety and security, so they go down to Samson and get him. And uh, and all Samson says is, you know, you can give me the Philistines as long as you don't kill them. And they said, no, we're not going to kill you. So they tied him up in ropes and gave him over to the Philistines. When the Philistines took him, they were happy. Samson's strength came. The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him again. And he snaps the ropes, grabs a donkey's uh, jawbone that he finds on the ground, and he kills 
all the Philistines. Wipes out a thousand of them with the jawbone of a donkey. Yeah, you okay. just randomly find that on the ground everywhere. I, I found a jawbone right in the right church. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're probably everywhere, you know. Uh, anyway, so so he wipes out an, you know, a thousand Philistines. So this is a very strong guy. He's, this is a guy that he knows that the Lord is with him. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him. So you get that same statement. Again, now we don't know how that happens or how it works, but he knew, and he wipes out a thousand of them. And then this is the the, um, the, the interesting part is uh, in verse eighteen. After after he, that, he threw the jawbone from his hand, and in verse eighteen of chapter fifteen, it says, "Then he became very thirsty, and he called to the Lord and said." You have given me this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Just kind of giving God a ultimatum to some extent. And you go, oh, that doesn't sound really good. But I find it interesting. Is it really ultimate or just he just comes across a title from well, the beginning? I want yes, this woman. I, I want this water. Right. I, I want, want this. this. I want this. I deserve this. You promised it to me. Like a big spoiled kid. He told me I'm supposed to do things. <laughs> right. And so now give me some water. Now, so what's what do you think God did? Well, he split open a rock and gave him water. Oh, wait a minute. God should have slapped him around a bit, you know? <laughs> At least... In, in my way of, uh, of, of thinking, right? You know, and my way is not a very good way because apparently I'm wrong. Um, but God said, "Yeah, okay." Here, I'll, you know, in the same, you know, not to the intensity of God splitting the rock for Moses and and feeding and, and giving water to all the Israelites, but He split a rock for uh, Samson, and uh, so God split the hollow uh, place that is in Lehi, so water came out of it. And when he drank, his strength returned, and he revived. And he judged Israel for 20, uh, 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Isn't there another way to see that, that instead of him, like, attacking God with this, whatever, kind of like, I can't believe this, I've done all of this, and now am I really going to die of thirst? And then when God gives him the water, it's showing him, you are still dependent on, on me. me. Yeah, I think that's I a very reasonable. I for you. Yeah. Wake up, Mr. Right. Right. But I don't think that was uh, Samson's intent going in. It's I, I think you're, you're right. Is Samson that was that was God's that message to him? Kind of thing, like, right. I just did all this amazingness. Is this really what's going to happen to me now? Come on, Lord, what's going on here? Kind of thing. I, I don't know that it's like a shaking of fist at giving water. Kind of. I, I don't know. Well, maybe not. Yeah, yeah you, you could easily be be, be right on it because without a doubt. God's demonstration of giving him the water was one that is I you, am, I am still your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though you did all this, I'm still yeah. right. I'm still I right. I, and I will remind you of that. And I think that's a that's a, a great way, you know, maybe to look Unfortunately, at Unfortunately the writer of Judges did not give us the tone of Samson's voice. No. <laughs> no. Unfortunately. Um, but he does give us enough, uh, uh, enough, if there was only one story, it'd be hard to get the tone. But the problem with this, Samson, we got like four stories, and they all have this same kind of entitlement tone to them, right? And so, so that definitely comes across overall in, in the story. And so then, the, then there's the harlot that starts in chapter 16, and it's only um, three three verses, but uh, Samson went to Gaza, which is a city in, uh, in, in, of the Philistines on the coast there, and he, he saw a harlot, went into her, and, uh, and then they surrounded, and they were going to catch him because they knew he was in there, and he, he uh, got up at midnight, left, grabbed the two gates from the city of Gaza, put them on his shoulder. I mean, this is a strong guy, right? Not too many people can take two huge you know, uh, city gates, you know, wooden city gates, um, and uh, rip them out of their, uh, you know, their hinges and put them on his shoulder and walk up the hill and place them on the hill that overlooks Israel. Uh, and if you think about it, um, the gates represent the weakest portion of a city's defense. But it's also because of that, it's also the most heavily guarded 
portion of a city. You have to, you know, you have to be able to get in and out. So you have to have gates, and the, you know, and if the gates fall, the city falls. And but that's the end of that story, and we don't know anything else about it. And so after this, starting in verse four, he uh, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. So the first of the three women that actually has a name. <laughs> And the lords of uh, the Philistines came to her. So the lords of the Philistines, there's five major cities in uh, Philistia. Each one of them would have had their own king. So you got uh, five major uh, 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 lords coming up to her and saying, uh, you got to find out where his strength is so we can overpower him, and we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver each. That's a big chunk of money. And so, so, so in the first case, the woman... Uh, you know, had to figure out how to undermine Samson in order to keep from getting killed. In the second case, Delilah, she needed to undermine Samson in order to get a huge reward. I mean, we're talking, we're talking big, big bucks here. And, uh, and so, uh, a, a, as you know, she went through multiple times asking him, oh, where's your strength come from? And every time he lies to her. So he's deceiving her. He's thinking he's smarter than her. He can tell her all kinds of stuff and make himself, uh, you know, he's the he's now the the deceiver. And it comes now uh, when you get to the end uh, of uh, of that uh, in verse fifteen. Finally, and see if you can see the common idea from the from his first wife in verse fifteen. Then she said to him. How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? And so the same methodology using to get under Samson's skin and says, you have deceived me these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, <laughs> I love this part, that his soul was annoyed to death. <laughs> You're killing me. Leave me alone. I, I'd rather die than hang out, you know. And and, uh, and you just get a feeling that uh, that you know from him that uh, that he, he he loves this woman, but he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. He just and so he finally gets he tell, he tells her what, that uh, that uh, if you shave my head, my strength will leave me. See, you know, one thing I don't understand about this, and maybe in terms of we study this. Is that she's already copped him up three times? Why right. doesn't he just yeah. literally say, clearly, I can't trust you because right. Right. Yeah. 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 why yeah. she yeah. just be figured that out? Yeah. Well, you that, false info and right. Well, that, that's kind of the point because it's the same thing happened with the first wo wo woman too, and mm -hmm. so it, it's that idea that Samson is given this great strength from the Lord, but what he wants to be is the smartest guy in the room, and he ain't. He's, he's just not the smartest guy in the, in, in the room. He doesn't get it. He doesn't. Uh, but at the same token, he ends up using his strength for the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord comes on him at the appropriate time, in the right circumstance, in order to accomplish the task that the Lord wants, not necessarily the task that Samson thinks he wants. And so you have these things going on, which I think is fascinating in this story, that Samson desires one thing, the Lord desires something else, and the Lord still uses what Samson does to accomplish his will. And the people around him, and sometimes even himself, don't actually know what's going on. And I think that's a takeaway to some extent for us. That God works, and we don't always see it, or know it, or understand it, but there's something there's something happening. That's a bit of comfort that you can know, even if you think you're trying to do the right thing, but you're really not doing the right thing, that God can still use it. You can use your screw up. Yes. And in fact, there's a sense in which he expects the screw ups and he wants to use them because he wants you to learn from them too. Maybe. I, you know, that may be a stretch. I think God. I, at least I, I feel in my life that he uses me in spite of myself to ultimately show 
that it's him, he's in control and he'll get the glory. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, it probably, and, and, and so I think Samson reflects this in the probably what I would contend is the saddest statement in the story. And it comes in verse 20 of, of uh, chapter 15 there, or 16. Um, it says uh, right before that, he's, he, you know, she cuts his, off his hair. He says, I'll go out and shake myself free. And here it is. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, and that's just a sad, and so what's important then to take away from that as we learn lessons from, from Samson is, uh, is can the Lord actually leave us and us not know? And I think that's a very important question to answer. But we won't answer it today. We will answer it next week. That will be the our intro next week. So you've got to come back to figure out whether, you're, whether the Lord can leave you or not. And I'll tell you the answer. The answer is no at this point because we're in a different... God deals with us differently than he's dealing with Israel and Samson here specifically. But, um, you know, we see that... Uh, Samson's unchecked, you know, because he was pious and he knew he was, he knew he was special. It ultimately leads him to kind of unchecked greed and desires. You know, he wanted things that he couldn't have. Um, and we, we talked about how God interacts with Samson. There was no angel of the Lord with Samson, but the spirit moved mightily within him. And yet, when the Lord left him, he didn't know it. So these, these are good things to struggle with on how God works with us. We saw that Judah didn't have a clue what was going on, so uh, you know they just gave Samson up. And then the last question, which we'll talk about uh, next week to open up, is uh, you know what's the role of the Spirit for us today? Not necessarily back then, and can the Lord actually leave us? This is a wonderful story with a lot of depth and little uh, rabbit trails you can walk down, but it does demonstrate that God uses different methodologies to talk to people in different ways. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we spend. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.